Good morning, church. I hope everybody's having a fantastic and wonderful morning so far this Memorial Day weekend. I want to take just a few minutes before we get started and just remember those who have served our country will want to thank you. And I know that we all know somebody um, that gave their life for our freedom and for this country. And we just want to take a few minutes right now to honor them. Uh, also honor our uh, fire department and our police department and our other services, our medical team, and all those who I know just work so hard to make our country great. I want to honor them this morning. And also, I know that during this time of COVID, there have been people who have lost loved ones. And I know the challenges and the struggle I've seen of not being able to uh, be with them at this end of life. So we're just going to take a couple minutes or a couple seconds here and just honor them and pray for them this morning. Father, I just, we thank you that we live in a free country, <laughs> Lord, and we thank you for those that serve our country and our nation and those that have lost loved ones, Lord, defending our country, Father. I pray that you just bless and minister to those families, God. And I also pray for those that have lost loved ones during this time of COVID and quarantine. And I pray that you just encourage them now as well. Help us never to forget those that gave their life for our freedom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you so much, everyone who has served our country. Uh, this morning, I know I'm, I'm in a side room, and this actually is our old library. And so we have been doing a ton of work here around the church. We have, uh, I want to thank Jerry and Glenn who came in, and we've replaced a ton of lights. So we have some new lighting in here. I know it's kind of hard to see in this corner, but if, if you haven't been in the church while, well, this whole wall and corner used to be covered with books. We've now moved them to the next room over and have a uh, want to thank Marjean for all of her all of her time Marjean I know that was a lot of work and, and you work tirelessly so thank you so much for uh, for being a, a, a servant and faithful and doing that it looks fantastic and so I just wanted to come into this room I know it's it's echoey and I, I do apologize um, but you know God is doing some really amazing things and and uh, it's fun to see what's happening here at the church. And I know you guys are going to be here with us soon, too. Uh, we just now are in phase two. And that gives us just a little bit more freedom. I also want to thank a big shout out to Titus, who came in this week as well. And he worked on our sound booth. We made that a little bit bigger. We're going to get that finished up hopefully this next week. And we are so excited about hopefully, hopefully, getting back in this building soon. Now, I do want to touch on that just a little bit because I know we had uh, our President, President Trump said that churches are essential as I believe they are. And coming together and praying and worshiping and being the church together is essential. However, don't get too excited just yet. We are still going to continue to meet in, in uh, our parking lot for those that are coming here. And uh, we'll start to loosen up some of the guidelines as kind of the phases go. We want to honor and respect our authority, but also continue to be the church and worship and minister and pray to one another and, and, and continue to be a good example in our community. So we're, we're spending a lot of time prayer. I'm wrestling over uh, a ton of things about what's the right thing to do. But you know what? I cannot wait till we are all back together, worshiping, hugging on each other, loving one another, and praising our Jesus in the sanctuary in this beautiful building that God gave us. So that's where we stand for that. Uh, thank you to all of our teachers who tried. We, you know, we worked so hard going through conference calls, using doing our discipleship classes. I know it wasn't uh, as we had drawn it up, but um, they have pretty much all wound down. And I know the women are going to be finishing up their last, uh, I think, chapter or page there in, in Ephesians, I believe they were in. And then they'll be taking the summer off as well. And so the classes are going to kind of start slowing down. But hopefully, now in phase two, we're going to try to start some small groups. So look forward to that and more information as well. I want to pray for our kids this morning and pray for our offering. You know, we want to thank you. You know, I, I cannot thank you guys enough. 
uh, your faithfulness, your continued support to uh, still give your tithes and offering uh, during this challenging season. But I want you to know that we are trying to be the best stewards we can and make the most with what God is giving us. And we're blessing our missionaries. And we were able to last month give away almost, uh, I think about $900 to missions, if my memory is correct. And we're gonna continue to give and support missions and those around the world. So remember, uh, your tithes and offerings go to the church. If you do wanna give to missions, make sure you write missions on there and 100% of that goes to our missionaries. So let me pray for our kids and our offering and then we'll get started. Father, we just thank you for everything you're doing, Lord. I pray that you just bless our children this morning, Lord. We know how important they are. I know how challenging, you know, here they have an early summer break, but they still have to finish their school. So be with them, be with their parents, their teachers, their principals, God. And uh, Lord, I also pray for, for our teachers that, that are trying to still minister to their students in school. Father, I pray that you just uh, encourage them, Lord, during this challenging time. I know they love and they miss them and they wanna be back with their students as well, but uh, be with them this morning. Lord, bless now this offering. Bless those that give, Father, and those that can. I just pray you bless them this week so they have something to offer you next week, Lord. We ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right. Well, hey, I've titled today's message, so hopefully you have your Bibles with you and you got a pen and paper, but I've titled today's message, As It Is Written. I got a chance last week um, to go have lunch with Pat. Pat, hopefully you're watching this, and I uh, had a, a tremendous time, and, and we decided to go up to Newport. Newport, the, the, some of the restaurants, are they're all starting to open back up, and so we went to the Mexican place up there, and we were just sitting and just talking about everything that's going on, and man, there's just so much, and, and I'm finding the challenge of getting back together and just connecting with one another during this isolation. It just just felt good to, to have lunch with Pat. And, and enjoy that. And you know, back then I heard that we might be opening up phase two, and then it happened Friday uh, morning. I got the news that you know phase two has happened here in Spokane County. We started to see different places in Spokane open up. Uh, restaurants are open up, and all I could think is, well, yes, it's about time. So, what was your first thoughts when you heard that phase two might open in Spokane? See, for me, I started to get excited. I started to think, well, finally, maybe there's a light at the end of the tunnel, this little bit of hope. And then the other day, Trump comes out and says, I believe churches are essential. We need churches to open. We need them to open now. And I 100% believe churches are essential. Prayer is essential. This is essential for us. It's essential for you. We need to be able to come together and encourage and uplift one another. This is what Paul talked about. And so... I started to get this excitement and, and this hope and that maybe we were taking baby steps in the right direction. Restaurants are open. You can get a haircut again. And if any of you guys need a haircut, I give pretty good haircuts. I've been practicing for the last 20 years. <laughs> um, so phase two, what does that mean for us? It means really what we can be around five outside people for the entire week. Okay, that's kind of a very challenging to get through but instead of complaining about that what i really begin to think of is how can i begin how can we begin to start some small groups how can we begin to form groups in our homes how can we bring five people maybe over and spend some time studying the word together encouraging one another having a, a dinner safely together right and and really praying with one another i think this is where our church is going to grow I think this is where some of us, God's going to place on our heart that we need to start bringing some people over and we need to start being, uh, almost starting our small group church in our homes. Is God calling you to do something like that? And then I begin to think of how we're going to start opening this church back up. So as I talked with Pat and asked him his thoughts, he just reminded me to keep preaching the word. I asked him, you know, what is this? What do churches need to do during this time? What's the right thing? You need to stay in the Word, he said. Keep preaching the Word. Churches need to keep preaching the Word of God. We cannot get away from that. We cannot allow ourselves to get distracted. So, I know the million dollar question is when are we going to be back inside the building? And I don't have a great answer for that, but the answer is we're going to continue to keep an eye on what the school's doing. We're going to continue to keep an eye on what other businesses and similar um, 
venues like ours are doing. Uh, well, number one, we want to be safe. We want to keep you guys safe. And we want everybody to come and worship. So we are going to keep doing outdoor service. I will continue, even after the church opens, to do online services. I, I do enjoy getting a chance to come and preach and talk to you guys. And, and, and I really do also start to see an online community grow. So thank you for being here. And let's get to go. I know a lot changed from week to week, so I don't want to make any promises. Today's message is titled, As It Is Written. We started on Romans this week, so if you've been reading along in the reading plan, you found out that we're in Romans, so I want to start there. Now, I believe, we believe that Paul wrote to the Romans about 57 A.D. That's a lot to remember why this is important, because Rome, if we study Rome, and you kind of look at early Rome, uh, Rome was going through uh, s political changes, um, and this is shortly after uh, the leaders have been changed and Nero had been put in place. Now, we, we learn a lot about Nero, and if you look him up online and you study ancient Rome, Nero was pretty much the worst person around. But when Nero was first put into power, it was around 54 AD, so about three years earlier. And really, we learned that the first four or five years from Nero, he actually did a pretty good job. Now, he got put in when he was about 16 or 17, so he probably had a lot of other influence. There were still people around kind of giving him the right guidance and direction. And so the first four or five years, we find he actually did okay. Then it all started to go downhill. And it went downhill quickly. And we find in 64 AD, so about, uh, let's see if I can do math here, about seven years after Romans is written and the church is established, there was this great fire in Rome. And Nero basically blames the Christians for it. And we, 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 um, history kind of shows it was probably Nero who did it himself or was a part of it. But he blamed the Christians as a scapegoat. And then he just started doing brutally uh, murdering and killing them. So Paul writes this letter during this transition. I want you to make sure you remember that concept. This really is before the heavy persecution. This heavy persecution for the Christians was coming, but it wasn't here yet. They were in a time where they were uh, an outside um, presence and belief and religion inside um, of, of Rome. So today we're going to be in Romans chapter 3. And, and as I read through this chapter, and even all of Romans, I want you to notice how many times we see, and Paul talks about this, as it is written. As it is written. All right, here we go. Here we go. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 1. It says, what, then what advantage... <clears throat> excuse me, has the Jew, or what is the benefit of circumcision? Always the great debate between Gentiles and Jews. It says, great in every respect, first of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. What then if some did not believe? Their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? Um, may it never be. Rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written, keep that in mind, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I'm speaking in human terms. May it never be, for otherwise how will God judge the world? But if through my lie the truth of God abounded to his glory, why am I also still being judged as a sinner? And why not say, as we are slanderously reported, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Their condemna condemnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. We have already charged that both Jews and Greek are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open gate. With their tongues they keep deceiving. 
The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their path, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the words of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So the first thing I want to talk about this morning is how Paul uses a scripture to address a difficult situation. So point number one is we have to use scripture to address difficult matters. See, Paul's one who started uh, and planted a lot of new churches. And all of them need a little help understanding uh, grace, the grace and mercy of Jesus. See, it didn't make sense to them. Uh, that they could just ask Jesus to forgive them their sin and it would just be gone. That concept just, they had not learned it. They had been taught this other way this whole time. See, the misconception of many churches was the understanding of sin and atonement. <clears throat> and so they've been raised thinking that sin and atonement were on this sort of scales that went back and forth like this. <clears throat> and so you would think, okay, well, okay, well, I sinned. And they just imagine that the more sin they had, it would kind of weigh it down like this. Or maybe you had, I don't know, we'll just use an easy number here, 100 pounds of sin over here, and the scales were like that. And so the only way to, to balance out that sin is, well, I needed 100 pounds of, this, uh, of sacrifice or atonement to cover that sin. So, so you would go and you say, well, here's all my sins, this 100 pounds or the 75 pounds, and it would balance the scales. That, that's how they would tell you. And so you had this kind of scale system of how they understood their sin. <clears throat> so how did they determine sin or unrighteousness? Well, it all came from the law. Right there in verse 20. It says, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So they realized, well, if I broke the law then I would be sinning. So if I broke the law so many times, well, it might be here. And if I broke the law more than so-and-so, then I might be way down here and he may be here. And so everything was based on this scale system. And they were using the law as their standard for righteousness. So Paul has to carefully address this issue and show them that the law cannot be our standard. Not that, that we can't just try to base our goodness off the law, our good, the standard has to now become God. You see the difference? The standard isn't, isn't the law because the law, the law has merits. And I say, okay, well, I can follow the law. I didn't do this. Okay, I didn't kill anybody. Okay, or, you know, I said a bad word. Okay, so that moves it down. And, and I use the Lord's name in vain. <clears throat> and I looked at my neighbor's wife or, or all these things. And we can kind of put a standard. But when it's compared to God, it's not like it's 100 pounds. It's like, it's like a billion pounds. It's, it's not even um, conceivable. It's inconceivable. Can I say that word? <laughs> Off the old Princess Bride movie? <clears throat> and so we talk about this when we start comparing to God. There is no way I can ever get the scale back. I can put all the goodness, all the sacrifice, all the atonement. And that scale doesn't even waver at all. <clears throat> and realize that this is a number we'd never be able to reach. Our unrighteousness can never compete with God's righteousness. Our unrighteousness, there's just no way we can get them to match. Even me at my best can, can never get that scale off the ground. It's just buried down there. And here's where Paul uses scripture to dive into this doctrinal debate. So we think about all these things. When we're talking about difficult matters, we have to use Scripture. So I love it. So he starts right here in verse, uh, in verse 9. I'm going to start in verse 9. He says, The what then of, of Romans chapter 3? What then are we better than they? No, not at all. For we've already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin, as it is written. There is none righteous, not even one. Now, I have the New American Standard Bible, and I, I almost always teach out of this. Uh, and it takes, and it'll do all caps, 
on the verses that are in the, that are uh, previous scriptures or Old Testament scriptures. And so all of these are capitalized. So I know that this is something Paul is talking about that was written before. And we can actually go back and look that this quote right here, it's from Psalms. It's from Psalms, Psalms 14, 1 through 3. Uh, uh, also uh, 5, verse 9. Um, Psalms 140, verse 3. Uh, verse 10, verse 7, verse 36, verse 1. Now, Paul, che Paul cheats a little bit. He doesn't take it quite in context. He kind of picks a few scriptures out, but he is quoting Old Testament scripture here. Then he throws in a little Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 20, and a touch of Isaiah, 59, 7, 8. And this is where Paul's message, Paul's scripture right here comes from. It's all from the Old Testament. This whole passage from, from 10 to, to 18 it's from the Old Testament. He's using scripture to defend this. Paul shows and explains that when you compare yourself to God, that everyone has sinned. When you quit comparing yourself to the law, or to brother so-and-so, or sister so-and-so, or this guy, or that guy, we've all sinned. We've all sinned. There's not even one person that's righteous. That changes the scale. When we realize that the scale, it's never going to line up. Everybody's sinned. And the same goes for us today. We have to use scripture. We have to use the word of God to defend our faith. I know there's a lot of stuff going on and we get into a lot of interesting conversations and I know I can share my opinions and my thoughts with people, but I, what I really need to do is share the scripture. I know there's a lot of great teachers, a lot of great books, a lot of great YouTube videos, but what I need to do is I need to use the scripture. So when you're talking to people about a difficult matter, don't just try to convince them. Don't try to say, well, hey, here's what I believe. Here's why you need to do this. All these. Show them what it says in the Word of God. Show them what it says in here. <laughs> do you know what it says in here? Is it just your opinion you formed? What does the Word of God say? And when you're defending your faith, and when you're defending difficult matters that the world believes and thinks, show them in the Scripture what the Bible says, what the Word says. Then you say, hey, well, that's what God says. I, I can't argue that that's what God says. And that is why you believe it. This also shows me why we must be in the Word of God, uh, the importance of knowing this Word of God. I begin to think as uh, Marjean was in here moving all these books, and I have, I have probably five or six Bibles in my office, and there was probably another 20 or 30 Bibles in the libraries. They moved them over, and I just begin to think, do I take Bible, the Word of God for granted? Do I take holding this in my hand for granted? I have everything I need on my phone or the internet. But what if I lost that? What if I lost that? Did, did you guys watch the video from Pastor Gary Emery? Remember, he, uh, he made a video for our church specifically, and it's on our YouTube channel. Um, and so you, you can go find it, look at it. And I watched that, and I watched it, and it, it was fantastic. And I watched it from a pastor's preacher's point of view. And I'm thinking, oh well, man, he didn't have his notes like I have here that kind of keep me on track and remind me of what my points are. And even more so, he didn't have this. Remember, Pastor Gary's gone completely blind. He didn't have the Word of God to hold up and read and, and put this message together and then write it all down and then get on the internet and research. Everything he taught and everything he teaches now, it's up here. It's because he knows it, because he hid the Word of God in his heart. He valued the Word of God. Whew, that stuck out to me a ton, just thinking that here's Pastor Gary one of our leaders in open Bible here. And he hid the Word of God in his heart. He knew the value of the Word of God. Wow. I tried to imagine what it would be like to, to prepare and preach if I was blind. I don't know how far I would get. I know a lot of Scripture, but man, I, just, I don't have it all memorized. And then it really challenged me. I need to hide God's Word in my heart. I need to start working on that. What would you do? 
Or what would happen if you lost your electronic Word of God? Your electronic resources. What would you do? What if you lost your sight? How much of this word do you have hidden in your heart? How much of this word do you know? How much of this word can you share with others? See this word? We have to use it to feed our soul. So turn me to Psalms 119. We're going to be coming back to Romans 3, so don't, don't lose that too much. But turn with me to Psalm 119. Proverbs Psalm 119. And I'm going to start right here in verse 9. Psalms 119, starting in verse 9, says, How can a young man keep his way pure? Men, <laughs> listen up. It says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. Keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word have I treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. Church, this is the importance of feeding your soul by knowing the Word of God, by valuing the words in this book, by studying the words in this book. He said in verse 12, Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I have told of all the ordinances of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies. As much as in all riches, I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget your word. Your word have I hid in my heart. I think about that, and I think about the importance of knowing this word and hiding it in my heart. Do I know enough scripture to keep preaching if I lost my sight? If I could not see and I could not read another word in here, do I know enough to keep teaching? to keep preaching, to share the faith, to lead people to the Lord, to encourage and admonish one another. Do I know enough? If I didn't have access to a Bible, there are countries, there are people who do not have access to a Bible, and believe it or not, the entire world does not have high-speed internet. Country church barely has high-speed internet. Now, you've heard me say this over and over and over, the importance of getting in the Word, of spending some time each day to read it or hear His Word. Even if we don't understand it with our minds, we need to read it. It still feeds your soul. You say, man, I read the Word, but I just don't understand it. Keep reading. Keep reading. Ask God to show you. He will show you because it may not, you may not understand up here, but it does feed your soul. It feeds your soul. It needs to be fed. This is for your soul this morning. This is in Psalms. I think, I think Psalms really just blesses and encourages me. And this is Psalms 98. And I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, preaching on it. But Psalms 98, we read this this week as well. It says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. For he has done wonderful things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained the victory for him. The Lord has made known for his self... Uh, has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his loving kindness and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth and sing for joy and sing praises. Sing praise to the Lord with the lyre. With the lyre and the sound of melody... With the trumpets and the sound of the horn, sing joyfully before the King, the Lord. Verse 7, let the sea roar and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equality or with equity. <laughs> with equity. Let me tell you, church, some of you need to hear this this morning, right here in verse 1. Sing to the Lord a new song because it says, For He has done wonderful things. I know some of you guys need to hear that this morning. He has done wonderful things. Some need to hear verse 3. He's remembered His loving kindness and His faithfulness to the house of Israel. 
Think about that. He's remembered loving kindness and faithfulness. He has not forgotten you. King David knew more than anybody the wonder of, Lord, where are you during this time? But he has not forgot you. And some of you need to hear this morning that God has not forgotten you. No matter where you are, no matter what's going on, no matter how much you've been isolated, God has not forgotten you. And that's why you need to keep reading this word. It feeds your soul. He has done wonderful things. Verse 5, some of us need to hear this. Sing praises to the Lord with the liar. The liar is not a liar. Like someone who doesn't tell the truth. The liar is more like an instrument. Like an electric guitar, maybe. A little bit of distortion. It says, sing to the Lord. Sing praises to the Lord. Some of us need, we just need to start singing praises to the Lord. We need to start declaring praises to the Lord. And that may be you this morning. And some of you need to hear that. And some of us maybe need to hear verse 9. It says, before the Lord, he is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness. You need to know that God is coming back and he is going to judge this world. Some of you need to hear that this morning. God will judge the world. He will take care of it. It's not your job to take care and to judge the world. It's not my job to take care and judge the world. It's my job to hide this word in my heart. It's my job to use this word to touch and, and defend delicate matters. And it's my job to share the truth. It's not my job to judge the world. That God is going to come back and take care of that. God is going to come back and take care of that. I know some of us have become dependent on many things for our information. Our TV, TV's on all the time, right? It's a beautiful thing, but it's not always healthy. YouTube, YouTube is full of tremendous information, and I tell you what, there are a thousand better pastors on there. There's so much great things on there. YouTube, you can find it. What a tremendous, what a fantastic resource that we have available to us now. The radio. But let me tell you something, church. That cannot take the place of this. It cannot take the place of the Word of God. I cannot watch a great pastor on YouTube. You cannot sit here and watch me preach to you and say, well, that's good enough for me for the next week. You can't go to the buffet at Golden Corral on Sunday and then starve yourself the rest of the week. It doesn't work that way. You need to feed your soul every day, and you need to feed it with the Word of God. Not just TV, not just YouTube. Those are all great. Not just the radio, but with the Word of God. Last thing. Use Scripture to build the church. Flip with me back to Romans. I'm going to keep going here in Romans chapter 3, verse 21. This is, this is a great chapter. It says, But now, Paul says, Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. And for those of us that have done any type of uh, soul winning or spreading the gospel, this is an iconic verse that is hidden in all of our hearts. It says, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And what does that mean? It means that all of us have this sin that's so far apart from God. There is no way there is that we could ever do enough to get the scale to even come close or even budge out the bottom. It says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When we understand that concept, it changes our thinking. Verse 24 we don't usually go, but we don't usually use this verse, but we, we need to keep going. It says, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as propitia propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. Here's now, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It's excluded. 
By what kind of law? Of works? No, but a man, or but by a law of faith. That's a whole other teaching, a law of faith. It says, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, is one. Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. <laughs> this debate isn't just to the Romans. It went through pretty much every church that Paul talked to. But it's this constant debate. We have the Jews who were circumcised and the Gentiles who were not. And we knew circumcision was a covenant uh, that God had with Abraham to distinguish his people. And so this constant thought that you have to do this because this is what the law says. And if you don't, well, hey, that's, that's, that, that moves you down the scale. And if you don't have this and you don't follow this law, well, now you're down here. To, you need to do all these sacrifices to, to cover that sin. Use Scripture to build the church. The last point I want to talk about today is how we can use Scripture to build the church. We can use it to uplift and encourage. You know, we look at uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. It says, All Scripture is inspired by God. That's another one we use all the time, right? It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So we use the Word of God to build each other up. I use it to encourage you to not give up, to keep going. That's why I just read in Psalms some. We use it, it gives us a standard to live by. There are still rules we need to follow. It helps us bring people into the church. It helps us share the need of a Savior. The book of Romans was addressed to the saints in Rome. This was addressed to the believers that were already there in Rome. You find that right there in uh, chapter 1, verse 7. Paul's using the scriptures to teach the things of God. The same goes for us. We cannot stray from the word of God. We cannot just form our own opinions and think, well, that makes sense to me, so it must be true. We have to stay in the word of God. What does the word of God say? Today, I want you to look at verse 23 and 24, and this is... We use this all the time. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if you're watching this today, the Bible says we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no reason we should be able to talk to God. There's no reason we should be able to be in His presence because we've all fallen short. This, in verse 24, is how we're able to do that being justified as a gift by His grace. This is what allows us to be in His presence. This is what allows us to go to the Father is this gift that He gave us. This shows us the need that we have for a Savior. And now when I think about that scale of sin and, and, and unrighteousness, we learn that Jesus doesn't make the scale balanced. I, I want you to grasp this concept that, you know, sometimes we, we like to rank our sins. We say, well, I lied, but it wasn't that bad of a lie, so maybe that's, a, we'll use five pounds of sin. But, you know, so-and-so, they killed somebody. That's, that's like 100 pounds of sin. And so-and-so, well, they stole. Well, that's, I don't know, 75. So we start rating all these sins, but you see God says, no, it's just all of sin and false short glory God. So it doesn't matter whether it's five pounds or it's 500 pounds. To God, it's like a billion and it's on the floor, and then there's no way it should ever matter. But what does he say? He says the grace of God. And God doesn't just say, well, you have a billion pounds of sin, so I'm just going to make it. It's like he takes that sin, he takes it off, and he, and he just tosses it in the trash. That scale's empty. Not that he remembers what happened. That scale is empty. The sin isn't just balanced out. That sin has been removed and taken away. That is what Jesus has done. That is the difference. When we start to understand this, this, this balance of sin and law and grace and, and, and all these big words of righteousness and unrighteousness, and we realize that God said, listen, you asked, 
let me take that from you. It's completely gone. All of it. It's not here to be brought back and reminded of your past and the sins and the failures and everything that's happened. God doesn't just, just kind of keep waiting and say, hey, you remember when you did that? He said, no. It's n there's nothing. That scale's empty. Well, I might start again today. Man, it's starting to weigh down. And he says, no, no, come to me. I got it. I got it. That is the gift of His grace. It's a gift that He gives. It's nothing we can earn. We have to understand we cannot earn our salvation. We cannot be good enough. We cannot earn our way because we are so far apart from His righteousness. We cannot do it. Now we can begin to understand what it means in verse 28 when he says, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. It's our faith. We're justified through our faith. Has nothing to do with the works. Has nothing to do with the law. As it is written, I want to encourage you guys today, the importance of the Word of God. The importance of this book. These scriptures, they're more than just a great book. And yes, there's a lot of great stories. There's a lot of things that make us feel good. There's also a lot of things that we can, you know, really uh, tell people and, and cram down their throat. It's so much more than a great book. We cannot take it for granted. We have to cherish and hide these words in our heart. And when we start to talk about difficult issues and people start asking us questions about what we should do and what we shouldn't do and what's right and what's not right, what does the Word of God say? And don't use the law as your standard. Use God as your standard. When our soul feels down, we need to use the Word of God. We need to look at the Scriptures when we're ministering to one another, when we're helping comfort and bring one of people, people through a difficult time, or we're comforting people. We need to use the Scripture. When we're sharing the Gospel, we need to use the Scriptures. The Scriptures have to be our guide. Like my friend Pat said, stay in the Word. I want to ask you guys just a few questions in closing. I really felt God put this message on my heart, the importance of the Word of God, and not that we've forgotten about it, but we need to make sure we continually are reminded the importance of the Word of God. Stay in the Word. I kept talking about today, you know, we use this for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And if you are watching this today, and you say, you know, I've never said yes to Jesus. I don't, man, I feel this weight. I feel like this scale is 500 pounds. I feel like this burden. I don't know how to lift. I've tried all these different things to, to get rid of that sin, to, to, to equal it out. I've tried to do enough good. I've tried to do enough of the right things just to make myself feel good this morning, just to be happy again. And let me tell you, if that's you this morning, you say, you know what? I want Jesus to, to not just balance a scale, but to remove that sin from my life. Or maybe you've been going down the long path for a while, and you need to come back to Him this morning. I want to pray with you this morning. The Bible says, we, we, we teach uh, ABCs the simplest way. Accept, believe, confess. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is the Lord, you will be saved. Remember, this is a free gift from God. You cannot earn it. I want to pray with you this morning. If you pray this prayer with me, uh, Lord promises that uh, you will be saved. And dear Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sin. I want you to be Lord of my life. Help me to follow you. I believe you died and rose again. Help me to cherish this word in my heart. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer right now, Lord says that the angels and the heavens are rejoicing. So we want to welcome you into his kingdom. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to start with getting in this word. Secondly, you know what? For some of you, if you're watching this, you say, you know what? I haven't, <laughs> I've kind of been neglected reading. I've, I used to do okay, but I just have a hard time reading. I have a hard time studying. I don't understand it. But if you need help this morning, getting back into the Word, and that's you, I want to pray with you this morning. Father, I pray right now for each and every one that's just having a hard time 
reading the word for whatever excuse it is, I pray right now uh, against that, Father. I pray that you start making the word alive and that as they open it up and they begin to read, Lord, it just fills and encourages and builds and uplifts their soul. In the name of Jesus, I pray that there's a hunger for them right now. And finally, if you would like God to help you use this word to build his church, some of you may be called to go and share the gospel. Some of you may be called to call a friend and to read them some scripture or email or write someone. We still do that. And some of us, you know, hey, we just, maybe, maybe God's calling you to start a small group during this time. I don't know. I want to pray with you this morning. God, I pray right now for those, Lord, that are just, they want to begin to serve. Lord, they want to take your word and go forth, Lord. And I pray that if they're going out, Lord, you show them the right people they need to talk to. Give them the right words. Show them which scriptures to give them, Father. Lord, I pray that uh, as they're praying and seeking the Lord, that if there's someone that's on their heart, Lord, you show them what scripture they need to call and you give them boldness and courage to call them or email them or text them and let them know what God is sharing, Lord, that it builds our church finally Lord and if there are people in here that just want to maybe start a small group Lord I pray that you give them the courage and and the right people to call Lord we thank you for what you're doing Lord we thank you for this time that we've had to be able to come together and worship you and study your scripture God I pray you just bless us this week Lord give us an opportunity to share your love with someone else keep us safe then we ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus and everybody said Amen. Amen, church. Hey, have a great week. We love you, and we can't wait to see you guys again soon. And, and if you're out in the area, feel free to swing by and say hello anytime during the week. God bless. Have a great week.